Welcome back to the channel, scholars. When last we left off, Ajax, Odysseus, and Phoenix were making their way to Achilles' tent in order to uh, appeal to him to come back and join the battle. So remember, this is like a small mini battle that occurs within the larger structure of the Iliad, which is a story of a war. So we've got this little mini battle here, and it's going to be a verbal battle, a debate. So remember to get back to that essential question. What are the strategies of persuasion and how do they work? Suspend yourself as you're reading it and try to put yourself in the shoes of an ancient Greek listener. How should Achilles behave based on these terms and ideas that we've established so far? And then finally, think about what are the markers for success in these various attempts to persuade Achilles? Who's the most successful? Who's the least successful? Is the assembly itself a success? So let's jump in here. We're just above line 220 where it says, So Ajax and Odysseus on page 257. So Ajax and Odysseus made their way at once where the battle lines of breakers crash and drag, praying hard to the God who moves and shakes the earth, that they might bring the proud heart of Achilles round with speed and ease. Reaching the Myrmidon shelters, remember Myrmidons are the warriors of Achilles, the ants. They found him there, delighting his heart now, plucking strong and clear on the fine lyre, beautifully carved, its silver bridge set firm, he won from the spoils when he raised Etienne's city. Achilles was lifting his spirits with it now, singing the famous deeds of fighting heroes. Across from him Patroclus sat alone in silence, waiting for Aeacus' son to finish with his song. And on they came with good Odysseus in the lead. So Achilles is sitting there and he's strumming this harp, this lyre and he's singing the deeds of heroes. So consider, what do we learn about the man Achilles? Who is he? What does he value? What strategies would you use to persuade a man like this to fight for you? And the envoy stood before him. Achilles, startled, sprang to his feet the lyre still in his hands, leaving the seat where he had sat in peace, and seeing the men, Patroclus rose up too, as the runner, as the famous runner called and waved them on. Welcome, look, dear friends have come our way. I must be sorely needed now, my dearest friends in all the Achaean armies, even in my anger. So think about what Achilles shows that he knows, even from this early point in the story this early point in the engagement. So Prince Achilles hailed and led the men, sat them down on, on settles with purple carpets and quickly told Patroclus, standing by, come, a bigger wine bowl, son of Minutius. Set it here, mix stronger wine, a cup for the hands of each guest. Here beneath my roof are men I love the most. Okay, so a bit of backstory here. Patroclus is a, like a what we would call a ward of Achilles. He's someone who is uh, related to Achilles and who kind of joins Achilles in his, his mission, in his quest, in order to share in the honor and the glory, almost like a captain. So Patroclus is there, and these three great warriors are there. And Achilles says, these are my most honored guests. Let's give them a cup of wine. These are the men I, I love the most. So he honors them. So again, think to what this says about Achilles as a man. What would he value? And so then what strategies would work to persuade him? He paused at about line 247, 248. Patroclus obeyed his great friend who put down a heavy chopping block in the firelight and across it laid a sheep's chine a fat goat and the long back cut of a full-grown pig, marbled with lard. Automedon held the meats while lordly Achilles carved them into quarters, cut them well into pieces, 
pierced them with spits, and Patroclus raked the hearth, a man like a god making the fire blaze. Once it had burned down and the flames died away, he scattered the coals, and stretching the spitted meats across the embers, raised them onto supports and sprinkled clean salt. As soon as the roasts were done and spread on platters, Patroclus brought the bread, set it out on the board in ample wicker baskets. Achilles served the meat. Then, face to face with his noble guest Odysseus, he took his seat along the farther wall. He told his friend to sacrifice to the gods, and Patroclus threw the first cuts in the fire. To sacrifice to the gods is to give him the best cuts of meat first, to show that you're a godly man. They reached out for the good things that lay at hand. So gods get their sacrifices, then the men eat. And when they had put aside desire for food and drink, Ajax nodded to Phoenix. Odysseus caught the signal. Filled his cup and lifted it toward Achilles, opening with this toast. Your health, Achilles. We have no lack of a handsome feast. I see that, either in Agamemnon's tents, the son of Atreus, or here and now in yours. We can all banquet here to our heart's content. But it is not the flowing feast that is on our minds now. No, a stark disaster, too much to bear. Achilles, bred by the gods, this is what we are staring in the face, and we are afraid. All hangs in the balance now, whether we save our, be our benched ships, I think it's beach ships, or they're destroyed. Unless, of course, you put your fighting powers in harness. They have pitched camp right at our ship's ramparts, these brazen Trojans. They and their far-famed far allies. Thousands of fires blaze throughout their armies. So you have to imagine, here are the ships of the Achaeans, the Greeks. Greeks, Achaeans are the same. And there, just beyond them, are thousands of burning fires where the Trojans have lined up their troops ready to attack. Nothing can stop them now. That's their boast. They'll hurl themselves against our blackened hulls, against the ships. And the son of Kronos, Zeus, sends them signs on the right, Zeus's firebolts flashing, and headlong Hector, delirious with his strength, rages uncontrollably, trusting to Zeus. No fear of man or God, nothing. A powerful, rabid frenzy has him in its grip. Hector prays for the sacred dawn to break at once, he threatens to lock the high horns of our sterns and gut our ships with fire. And all our comrades penned against the hole, panicked by thick smoke. He'll rout and kill in blood. A nightmare. I fear it with all my heart. I fear the gods will carry out his, his threats, and then it will be our fate to die in Troy, far from the stallion lands of Argos, up with you. Now, late as it is, if you want to pull our Argives, our hard-hit armies clear of the Trojan onslaught, fail us now? What a grief it will be to you through all your years to come. No remedy, no cure. No way to cure the damage once it's done. So think now, the end of page 259, how you would describe Odysseus's strategies of persuasion so far. What has he managed to lay out to, let's say, attack the defenses of Achilles using his st strategies of persuasion? What are the strategies so far are they successful? Why? Top of page 260. 
Come, while there's still time. Think hard. How can you fight off the Ar Argyre's fatal day? Oh, old friend, surely your father Peleus urged you that day he sent you out to Phthia to Agamemnon. My son, this is Peleus, a a Achilles' father, speaking now, or so Odysseus would have Achilles think. My son, victory is what Athena and Hera will give you, if they choose. But you, you hold in check that proud, fiery spirit of yours inside your chest. Friendship is much better. Vicious quarrels are deadly. Put an end to them at once. Your Achaean comrades, young and old, will exalt you all the more. That was your aged father's parting advice, says Odysseus now. It must have slipped your mind. But now at last, stop, Achilles. Let your heart devouring anger go. The king will hand you gifts to match his insults, if only you'll relent and end your anger. So come then, listen, as I count out the gifts. Now stop for a second. Can you remember what the gifts were that Agamemnon promised? See, there was seven tripods and maybe some women and, well, let's see. The troves in his tent that Agamemnon gives to you. Seven tripods never touched by fire. Ten bars of gold, twenty burnished cauldrons, a dozen massive stallions, racers who earned him trophies with their speed. He is no poor man who owns what they have won, not strapped for goods with all that lovely gold, or trophies those high-strung horses carried off for him. Seven women he'll give to you, Flawless, skilled in craft, women of Lesbos, the ones he chose, his privilege, that day you captured the Lesbos Citadel yourself. So a little bit of a twist on what Agamemnon had said. He gets the you in there. These he will give you, and along with them will go the one he took away at first, Perseus' daughter, and he will swear a solemn, binding oath in the bargain. He never mounted her bed, never once made love with her. The natural thing, my lord, men and women join. Now all these gifts will be handed you at once. But if, later, the gods allow us to plunder the great city of Priam, you shall enter and win. we share the spoils, load the holds of your ship with gold and bronze, as much as your heart desires and choose for your pleasure twenty Trojan women, second only to Argive Helen in their glory. And then, if we can journey home to Achaean Argos, pride of the breasting earth, you'll be his son by marriage. He will even honor you on par with his Orestes, full grown by now, reared in the lap of luxury. Three daughters are his, in his well-built halls, Christmos and Laodice and Iphianicia. And you may lead whichever one you like with no bride price asked home to Peleus' house, and he will add a dowry, yes, a magnificent treasure, the likes of which no man has ever offered with his daughter. Seven citadels he will give to you, filled with people, Cardamile, Enope, and the grassy slopes of Hyre, Fry the Sacrosanct, Anthea deep in the meadows, rolling Apia and Pedasus, green with vineyards, all face the sea at the far edge of sandy Pylos and the men who live within them, rich in sheep flocks, rich in shambling cattle, will honor you like a god with hordes of gifts and beneath your scepter's sway live out your laws, sleek and shining peace. What does this recital show about Odysseus? That Agamemnon said this and Odysseus repeated it 
perfectly with some variation to fit the circumstance after hearing it only one time. What does it show about Odysseus? And from that, what might you predict would be Achilles' response? Just after line 360. All this he would extend to you if you will end your anger. But if you hate the son of Atreus all the more, him and his troves of gifts, at least take pity on all our united forces mauled in battle here. They will honor you honor you like a god. Think of the glory you will gather in their eyes. Now you can kill Hector, seized with murderous frenzy, certain there's not a single fighter his equal, no Achaean brought to Troy in the ships. Now for once you can meet the man head on. Achilles' response will follow. Take a moment, though. Make a prediction. What do you think his response will be after hearing this? Try to think back to these terms that we outlined so far. How would he respond? The famous runner Achilles rose to his challenge. Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, great tactician. I must say what I have to say straight out. I must tell you how I feel and how this will end, so you won't crowd around me one after another. Uh -oh. Coaxing like a murderous, oh, sorry, coaxing like a murmuring clutch of doves. I hate that man, like the very gates of death, who says one thing, but hides another in his heart. I will say it outright. That seems best to me. Will Agamemnon win me over? Not for all the world, nor will all the rest of Achaea's armies know what lasting thanks in the long run for warring with our enemies on and on, no end. One and the same lot for the man who hangs back and the man who battles hard. The same honor waits for the coward and the brave. They both go down to death the fighter who shirks, the one who works to exhaustion. And what's laid up for me? What pittance? Nothing. And after suffering hardships, year in, year out, staking my life on the war mortal risks of war, like a mother bird hurrying morsels back to her unfledged young, whatever she can catch, but it's all starvation wages for herself. So for me, many a sleepless nights I've bivouacked in the harness. Bivouacked is a great word. Bivouacked. Notice the ED. So if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see that there are two definitions, a noun and a verb. Bivouac, bivouacked. The ED signifies that it's the verb. Look that word up and see what he's referring to when he says that he bivouacked in harness. Day after bloody day, I've hacked my passage through, fighting other soldiers to win their wives as prizes. Twelve cities of men I've stormed and sacked from shipboard. Eleven I claim by land. So this guy has taken 23 cities on the fertile or earth of Troy. And from all I dragged off piles of splendid plunder, hauled it away, and always gave the lot to Agamemnon, the son of Atreus. 
always skulking behind the lines, safe in his fast ships. And he would take it all. He'd parcel out some scraps, but he'd keep the lion's share. Some he'd hand to the lords and kings, prizes of honor, and they, they hold them still. From me alone, Achilles, of all the Achaeans, he seizes, he keeps the bride I love. Well, let him bed her now, enjoy her to the hilt. How, we're gonna pause here and pick it up in the next video, but I want you to think, how is Achilles responding here? Clearly not well, but think about it in terms about how he characterizes Agamemnon. Based on what you know of Agamemnon, from what he said, and from what we've talked about so far, is this characterization justified? Is Achilles right to think these thoughts? Welcome back. When last we left off, Achilles was absolutely slamming Agamemnon's offer as it was made by Odysseus. We're going to pick it up right around line 410. As we continue to go forward, keep in mind the answer that you are able to generate to the question how Achilles is characterizing Agamemnon, and that what this characterization may say about both Achilles and about Agamemnon. Do you think that this uh, characterization is justified, or is Achilles just running off at the mouth, just coming up with any bad thing that he can say about this guy? as a way to feel better about himself, let's say. So right at about line 409, Achilles continues with his diatribe, his slamming of Agamemnon, by questioning the very reason why they're there. Why must we battle Trojans, men of Argos? Why did we muster an army? Why did he muster an army? This is Agamemnon. Lead us here, that son of Atreus. Why? Why in the world, if not for Helen, with her loose and lustrous hair? Are they the only men alive who love their wives, these sons of Atreus? Never. Any decent man, a man with sense, loves his own, cares for his own as deeply as I, I loved that woman with all my heart, though I won her like a trophy with my spear. But now that he's torn my honor from my hands, rob me, lie to me. Don't let him try me now. I know him too well. He'll never win me over. So why won't Agamemnon ever win Achilles over? Think about that. Achilles says, he's never going to win me over. Why not? No, Odysseus. Let him rack his brains with you and the other captains how to fight the raging fire off the ships. Look, what a mighty piece of work he's done without me. Why? He's erected a rampart, driven a trench around it, broad, enormous, and planted stakes to guard it. No use. He still can't block the power of man-killing Hector. No, though as long as I fought for Achaea's lines, Hector had little lust to charge beyond the walls. Never ventured beyond the sea and gates and oak tree. There he stood up to me alone one day and barely escaped my onslaught. So think about what Achilles is doing here now. Why is he suddenly switching to talk about Hector and their battle by the oak tree? What, what is he doing here, and what does that have to do with Agamemnon's offer? Ah, but now, since I have no desire to battle glorious Hector, tomorrow at daybreak, 
Once I have sacrificed to Zeus and all gods and loaded up my holds and launched out on the breakers, watch, my friend, if you'll take the time and care to send me off. And you will see my squadrons sail at dawn. Fanning out on the Hellespont that swarms with fish, my crews manning the oarlocks, rowing out with a will, and if the famed god of the earthquake grants us safe passage, so the god of the earthquake is the same god that manages the seas, because earthquakes can sometimes cause typhoons or uh, tsunamis. So um, the ancient Greeks conceptualized or understood that the god of earthquakes and the god of the seas are the same, and that is Poseidon. So he's saying that the god of the earthquakes grants us safe passage, so allows us to sail on his seas. The third day out we raise the dark soil of Phythia. There lies my wealth, hordes of it, all I left behind when I sailed to Troy on this, this insane voyage, and still more hordes from here. Gold, ruddy bronze, women sashed and lovely, and gleaming gray iron. And I will haul it home. All I want is plunder, all but the prize of honor. He who gave that prize has snatched it back again. But outrage! That high and mighty Agamemnon, that son of Atreus, go back and tell him all, all I say, out in the open too, so often the Achaeans can wheel on him in anger if he still hopes, who knows, to deceive some other comrade. Shameless. Inveterate, armored in shamelessness. Dog that he is, he'd never dare to look me straight in the eyes again. No, I'll never set heads together with that man. No planning in common, no taking common action. He cheated me, did me damage, wrong, but never again. He'll never rob me blind with his twisting words again. Once is enough for him. Die and be damned for all I care. Zeus who rules the world has ripped his wits away. His gifts, I loathe his gifts. I wouldn't give you a splinter for that man. Not if he gave me 10 times as much. Twenty times over, all he possesses now, and all that could pour in from the world's end. Not all the wealth that's freighted from Orgamenos, even into Thebes, Egyptian Thebes, where the houses overflow with the greatest troves of treasure. Thebes with a hundred gates, and through each gate's battalions, two hundred fighters surge to war with teams and chariots. No, not if his gifts outnumbered all the grains of sand and dust in the earth. No, not even then could Agamemnon bring my fighting spirit round until he pays me back, pays me full measure for all his heartbreaking outrage. So what a proclamation, what, a, what an announcement. Not if all of his prizes, bars of gold and tripods and, and uh, spears and breastplates and anything a warrior of this time who lives off of Geras and Teme, all of the things that he could possibly want, such that all of those prizes outnumbered, and I love this, the number of grains of sand and dust in the earth. So give you some idea of the magnitude of things that we're talking about. Not even then would Achilles come around and fight. And so we're forced to ask, if Timae and honor are the most important things, why not? Well, clearly he'd be the richest man in the world, but then 
why wouldn't he accept those gifts? What's missing here? What's the missing piece? And if all of those things can't pay back what Achilles lost, how could Agamemnon pay him back? Listen here. <laughs> this is when stuff starts to get personal right around like 475. His daughter. I will marry no daughter of Agamemnon. Not if she rivaled Aphrodite in all her golden glory. Not if she matched the crafts of clear-eyed Athena. Not even then would I make her my wife. No, let her father pitch on some other Argive, one who can please him, a greater king than I. If the gods pull me through and I reach home alive, Peleus needs no help to fetch a bride for me himself. Plenty of Argive women wait in Hellas and Phthia, daughters of lords who rule the citadels in power. Whomever I want, I'll make my cherished wife at home. Time and again, my fiery spirit drove me to win a wife, a fine partner to please my heart, to enjoy with her the treasures my old father Peleus piled high. I say no wealth is worth my life. Not all they claim was stored in the depths of Troy, that city built on riches, in the old days of peace before the sons of Achaea came, and all the gold held fast in the archers' rocky halls, in Phoebus Apollo's house, on Pythos' sheer cliffs, cattle and fat sheep can all be had for the raiding, tripods all for the trading, and tawny-headed stallions. But a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me. Remember, Achilles' mother is a demigod. She's the one who I was talking about who got married at the very beginning of the story. So she's the one who married Peleus. And she tells him what many people know is Achilles' fate. So this is what Achilles' fate is. Mother tells me that immortal goddess Thetis, with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on the way to death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I voyage back to the fatherland I love, my pride, my glory dies. True, but the life that's left me will be long. The stroke of death will not come on me so quickly. So here's what Achilles is saying. He's got two paths in his life. He's a rare mortal in which his life is not totally determined. The Greeks believe that our lives are like strings of fate and that are measured and cut by these very powerful goddesses called the fates. Achilles is like two strings. Okay? On the one side, he could stay at Troy, fight and die, but his story, his story never dies. Well, look at that. On the other side, if he chooses to go home, he'll live a long life. But once he's made that choice, his story will fade from history. Well, you can guess which way he chose, but think about what he's trying to tell this embassy about what he values about himself. And think about what would convince a man in that position. Would gifts do it? Why or why not? Right? Think about that. Is Agamemnon right to treat him in this way? And if you can figure out why, you can figure out what Achilles would want. One thing more. To the rest, I pass on this advice. So not only is he, he's, he's telling you 
Agamemnon's offer is pure garbage. But I'm going to tell you one more thing. And this is something you should all take to heart and follow my lead on this. Sail home now. You will never set your eyes on the day of doom that topples looming Troy. Thundering Zeus has spread his hands above her. Her armies have taken heart. So you go back to the great men of Achaea. You report my message, since this is the privilege of senior chiefs. Let them work out a better plan of action. Use their imaginations now to save the ships and Achaea's armies pressed to their hollow holes. This maneuver will never work for them. This scheme they hatched for the moment as I raged on and on. But Phoenix can stay and rest the night with us so he can voyage home. Home in the ships with me to the fatherland we love tomorrow at dawn. But only if Phoenix wishes, I will never force the man to go. And so here ends Achilles' first refusal, let's call it, of the offers. Next up is Phoenix. Keep in mind, Phoenix is a man who helped to raise Achilles, and that's why he's offering to allow Phoenix to stay with Achilles. But Achilles has kind of thrown down the gauntlet, and he said, look, you don't get me. And these gifts, they're worthless to me. Not if they could be piled up as high as a mountain. Not if they numbered and outnumbered the grains of sand and dust in the world would I accept them. And so we've got to go back and we've got to think about what is valuable in the Greek world and what would be valuable to Achilles as the audience that is to be persuaded. And so we'll pick up with Phoenix's appeal in our next video. But keep those thoughts in mind. What's it going to take for a guy like Achilles? Thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you in the next lesson.